Hey, Ryan, great to have you here today with us. Thank you for joining. How you doing? Good. I really appreciate the opportunity. Always great to chat with you. No problem. It's our, it's our pleasure. I must say, firstly, um, Brooks running shoes that I've been using now for the last month or so are hands down the most comfortable, lightest, best running shoes I've ever owned. I can't believe that uh, I hadn't tried those out till this time. So, uh, so it's yeah, doubly exciting to have you to have you on board. Um, I, I kind of like starting off these uh, conversations uh, with our guests and asking them how they ended up in cyber. So, what's your journey been? Sure. I would say I'm one of the more traditional routes into cyber. Uh, I went to school for management information systems, so a cross between business and technology. Wound up getting a job at a large health insurance company in an IT rotational program. So every six to eight months, we would switch into a different part of IT. I went into it thinking I wanted to be a project manager, and after six months, quickly found out that's not the case. Yeah, you know, I like more of the hands-on work. So after my second year. Uh, the health insurance company got their, I think it's one of their first CITOs. Um, he just brought this incredible culture into the company to the point where every day at four o'clock, you know, everyone's job pretty much will stop in security and infrastructure and such. And we would talk about the latest threats and vulnerabilities that people are reading about or reported and then have that discussion, you know, like, and no other company I heard where the security person brings it up to the infrastructure person on the call and they develop a plan to remediate it, you know, maybe within a few days. Um, then there were different engineers that talked about their activity on the dark web and keeping an ear to the ground. So I was enthralled um, and really haven't looked back since. That's, that's so exciting to hear. I mean, just, just firstly, that comment about you doing sort of project management for a year and then and then switching, right? It, it definitely reminds me of a conversation that I had prior to my first job out of university uh, on the analyst program. And I essentially had sort of on, on in the left hand, it was, hey, you could take a job in IT project management. And on the, on the right hand, it was, you could take a job in cyber. I'm like, well, there's only one choice there, right? It's not the left hand. So, yeah. But that, that culture of learning is so great to hear because that uh, you're absolutely right that opportunity just literally down tools and then spend half an hour an hour of your day every day on learning and discussing and sharing ideas is such an incredible um is such an incredible opportunity to have um what like sort of just from those first early days experiencing that what were the things that you came away with sure i mean just having that growth mindset like 10 years ago we just started talking a little bit about public cloud, but more around virtual machines. And even within the last year or two, you know, I had to basically learn about containers and DevSecOps from scratch and know just enough to give requirements for people who have been doing this for five years Yeah, in both a confident fashion, but also, you know, a mutual agreement. Like we're not going to give them requirements and say, you must do these, but asking them, you know, they know a little bit about security. Um, so just when you think, you know, the technology things advance, um, and you have to learn the next one, um, but being open to learning about it, it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, when in that, in that sort of initial sort of discovery of, of cybersecurity and threats, can you share maybe a particular sort of security capability, or maybe it's a threat um, that sort of caught your eye and said, God, that's really exciting. I want to, I want to, this is what I want to pursue. Yeah. I think, you know, looking back about 10 years ago, the most exciting technology was CrowdStrike and the EDR space. You know, I grew up knowing the basics of like Sophos or Vera and, you know, having those do basic scans. But then when I saw the visibility that something like a CrowdStrike can do or really any other EDR vendor. Um, to look at that process tree and use that behavioral based approach, I thought that was really, really cool. So, I mean, that, 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 that sort of shift from sort of heuristic based detection to behavioral detection was obviously like a seismic change in the way, um, particularly that we did sort of um, endpoint based protection, right? But 
and and that that's developed significantly over the last 10 years with sort of the evolution of ml and ai based technology so and i i know you were at rsa recently was there anything exciting or, or, or i should sort of rephrase that and say what was particularly exciting about what you saw from the vendors there yeah from rsa i thought some of the coolest technology was you know you have your cloud security protection you know cloud configure looking for cloud configuration um which is you know which is really helpful but for me i want to know what threat actors are are doing you know and mapping that to the controls of mit, usually misconfigurations for cloud platforms you know there's a lot of cloud configuration platforms that they'll just give you 300 high alert which is not helpful for me yeah um, so I'm starting to see vendors do some more risk-based approach where, you know, maybe the, it can detect that it has a public IP address associated with it and open internet access, or, you know, this is um, a misconfiguration that's being exploited in the wild. So I'm starting to see a little bit more of a threat-based approach to, you know, public cloud misconfiguration, which is really helpful as an engineer. And, and use the word or the terms risk-based and threat-based, right? And we hear these a lot, um, and particularly in sort of vendor architecture, right? Um, and uh, what, like, as a practitioner and as a, uh, as a very experienced practitioner, right? When you say risk-based and when you say threat-based, what do you mean very precisely? So when I use those two terms, I typically think about um, like vulnerability management. So you can't patch everything. You know, you have to really have a high level of fidelity for how critical it should be when you go to your infrastructure team. So some things I look at, which some vulnerability management tools do better than others are, is the asset publicly face, public facing? Is the vulnerability, does it have proof of concept, like exploit code out there? Is it actively being exploited, which Stitha does a really good job with the known exploited vulnerability list now? Mm -hmm. What's the level of complexity it would take a hacker? Like, can they just type in a one line command line using Metasploit, or does it contain, like, does it require a high level of complexity? And then what's the level of user interaction? You know, is it, are they sending an email where they don't even have to open it, or does it require a user to click a couple times? So those are usually the things that on top of the DVSS score that help us really prioritize, you know, what we should be looking to remediate first. And, and I think you use the term sort of exposure and what is the, what is the real sort of exposure, exposure risk of, of vulnerabilities? Like how, as a, as a practitioner, how do you build a picture of exposure of your assets? Um, for your organization? Yeah, that's really hard. Asset management at most of the companies I've been at has definitely been a challenge. You know, you have assets all over the place. You know, you have people coming and going as far as like workstations. You have new servers that are being built, spun up. Um, you have DevSecOps where you have ephemeral servers being spun up on top of your public cloud. I and mean, I've been burned in, pa in the past for pen tests where you know, we have a Windows 2008 box that was jacked up, didn't have our EDR agent. The pen tester found it, exploited it, and then moved laterally and got domain admin access. So the best methods I've found recently are like API access into like your VMware stack, public cloud presence, whatever you use, your MDM solution. So that way you're not relying on an agent being installed or you know, a step being taken. So there's a couple of vendors out there that are doing a really good job um, as far as using the API connection to your different platform. But then also a challenge as a practitioner is making sure all of your agents are everywhere, which that I've never had 100% compliance across all agents, across all yeah. servers, you know, yeah. workstations. So being able to, instead of manually going through and looking at your EDR vendor and your bold management vendor, there are tools that'll run API calls. They'll get that one host name and it'll say, well, we see EDR, we see bone management, but we don't see the, the tool that pulls your logs and sends them to the sim. Mm -hmm. So it makes it way easier other than, 
Otherwise, you know, you're doing that yourself, which, you know, it, you're not always going to get hundred percent. So like that thing about you're never going to get hundred percent and you're always sort of, you're always playing catch up. Right. And I, and I don't, I don't mean this in the context of like, we often see, oh, well, like attack is always one step ahead. I'm not talking about it from that perspective, but as you said, right, just on basics, we're always playing catch up, whether it's with patching or whether it's asset discovery, et cetera. So how do you determine what is good enough, right? What is like an acceptable level? And then beyond that, it's a, it's a bonus, but also the cost of doing better is also potentially prohibitive. Like, how do you set that? Because yeah. like, uh, and, and not, not to cut you off because ex again, like going back to that example of that windows 2008 server that you just didn't know about. Right. And that's the, that's kind of the, the vulnerability that ends up getting exploited. So how do you strike that balance? Yeah. I'm really glad you brought up the phrase good enough. Cause that's something I, <laughs> I live by in the security field. You know, I, I worked in heavily regulated companies like health insurance and FinTech, um, where it's pretty, and you know, cardholder data, where it's pretty prescriptive on what you have to do, but no company I've worked for is in the business to be secure. Brooks is in business to sell shoes and we're trying to minimize, you know, our, our tax surface. And if, and when we do get hit with ransomware, then it doesn't take us out of the company. So, you know, for working in the retail sector for better, or for worse. There's no compliance framework that we really have to abide by from a yeah. holistic perspective. So we'll use things like NIST cybersecurity framework or DIF top, what was 20, I think it's 18 now. And then we usually once a year, we'll take a look at, and we rate ourselves, you know, at the different controls because, you know, let's say, um, asset management, right? It's important for us. And if we put ourselves on a scale of one to five. Maybe we're at a two or a three, but maybe we don't get to a five. Like what's the mm -hmm. level of effort to get from a two to a three versus three to four and four to five. At what point do we call it good enough, you know, based on our size, you know, how we're staffed yeah. and then move on to the next. So really we take a look at it. What's most important to us. Asset management is obviously very important. Um, and then we determine, you know, what's an acceptable score for it and improvement. That's, that's really interesting. And I, I want to, and you said like some really interesting things there about the, um, contrasting sort of heavily regulated industries like finance, like healthcare versus a far less regulated industry, particularly when it comes to sort of, I guess, cyber security requirements, like sort of manufacturing and retail. And, and when I think about those highly regulated industries, typically they, they sort of have there's like three levers, right? The, the sort of the one is the regulation. Um, one is a very clear idea of, oh, this is something that I absolutely have to protect. Otherwise, um, loss of reputation, loss of um, business revenue, et cetera. And then there's often been like a, a seismic event that affects that industry, that sector, uh, which means that no one else wants to be the headline act. Like, but now in this, in the unregulated, not, not, not unregulated, but the less regulated uh, sort of industries, how do you, how do you essentially build that, um, those levers to move your program forward? Yeah. I think the most important thing that, you know, we've done at Brooks and I've seen other companies is having that, um, steering committee. So my boss meets with the COO, CFO, head of privacy, head of legal. And for them to understand the importance of security, that buys us a ton of leverage. So I think that's really the most important thing. You need buy-in from the C-suite and to be able to articulate where we are, where we need to get to be and what it takes, you know, whether it's like money or people, um, it, it's really how I found the most successful way to do it. And, and how do you contrast sort of the role that you do today at Brooks? with some of the roles at your previous employers in those regulated industries, like what are the, like, what are the challenges in, in one versus challenges in the other? Um, and, and so, because it's, it's really interesting that you've kind of moved around in these different industries doing this role. Yeah, I think our North star is a little bit different. So working in, you know, a highly regulated industry for like HIPAA for insurance, 
we were much more data driven. So, you know, we used tools to find um, confidential restricted data. We did more around data lock prevention. Not to say we don't do that at Brooks, but we don't have that data that is highly regulated. Where at Brooks, we're much more focused on availability. Um, so looking at like ransomware drives a lot of what we do. So yeah, I would say, you know, while we do think about maybe some like proprietary type data and in intellectual property, we're much more focused on availability from different threats. And I find that sort of really fascinating, right? Because like, when you think about that traditional sort of the CIA triangle of, 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 of security, right? It's kind of the C typically gets sort of a lot of focus, right? And the I gets a decent amount of focus and the A often gets not, not ignored, but is like the, the bit that everyone is willing to sacrifice in order to protect the C and the I. But it, it, again, I think I feel particularly with sort of these ter like the term cyber resilience really coming into vogue over the last couple of years that the focus on the A is, is increasing and organizations are putting far more importance on the availability pillar of the CIA triangle in addition to the C and the I. Is that, is that how you see it? I really do. Yeah. We think about the availability of, you know, our ERP system. One thing I've noticed is more and more companies are, from my experience, testing that ransomware recovery. It's one thing mm. to put it in place, but to be able to find out how long it actually takes and then actually recover it and have that business user be able to um, get the data that they need to, it's really important because you don't want to do that for the first time when you're yep. hit with ransomware. And then it's super interesting to find, you know, I've been involved with business continuity efforts and let's say someone needs application X, Y, Z, you ask them how quickly and they say an hour because right. why not, you know, why not say an hour when yep. in reality, it might take our infrastructure team eight hours and then figuring out that discrepancy where they can say, we can do it in an hour, but you're going to have to pay for another data center that, you know, active, active and writing and. It'll cost, say, a million dollars. And then they're like, well, eight hours sounds pretty good. Yeah. So managing yeah. those expectations of how long it actually takes for yeah. those critical applications is important to level set. Is it, it takes longer than you think. Yeah. So, yeah you said, so that there's just, just a couple of things. Uh, sorry, I get really excited when sort of the, the, our guests sort of, sort of just this stream of thought and everything I saw, I, I kind of want to double click on all of those things. So let, 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 let's start sort of at the, at the beginning of that stream of thought. And you talked about like effectiveness and how, how effective are my controls? So a bit of a loaded question in your perspective. And again, this goes back to sort of your, your time in more regulated industries is what do you see as the difference between being compliant and being secure. Yeah, that's a huge difference. The so compliant can be used in you know a positive way. You know, in working in with credit card um, data, PCI is really prescriptive and it it does have a lot of great things, but it also recommends eight character passwords, which I have a hard <laughs> time with. So it's a good baseline and you can use it to get stuff done. But, you know, I think having that threat based approach of, mm. you know, what industry are you in? How are attackers, you know, going about it? For instance, with cloud, you know, Gartner comes out with, I think 90 to 95% of cloud breaches are misconfiguration. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that audits are talking about that, but yeah. that's important because we have a cloud presence. Um, so compliance is good. You know, it can be your friend, but that can't be all that you do. Yeah. And it's kind of the, the, the way I, I look at this sort of from, from previous roles is that often compliance and audits are checking against a, a checklist or a set of standards that you have, you have defined versus, as you say, like based on compared to sort of what is the real threat and how could it exploit this current this current configuration. So that then brings kind of brings me onto the follow on question to that sort of stream of, um, of thoughts you shared is that 
how do you test that your controls are effective? So now you're coming about my passion project and my last couple of jobs. Um, so oh, when I first, when, yeah, when <laughs> I first started, you know, talk about the tenure evolution, you'd pay a pen tester, you know, however much money, and they would basically just run a Nessus scan and tell you these yeah. are all your vulnerabilities and, and that was it. Yeah. The next part, you know, I've seen is now you pay a pen tester. Maybe you give them access in your environment. Maybe you don't. Probably not. They try to get in. They might get in. They'll get access. And then you fix those things. In the last couple of years, you start to see the evolution of purple teaming and tools like Atomic Red Team, where now someone who is not trained as a formal pen tester can actually run simulation of what hackers are using. So I'll look at different reports from like Mandiant or Red Canary, and it'll say these are the top 10 hacker techniques that we've seen over the last year. And then I'll actually use a tool to run those techniques on my laptop in our network. We'll see what our EDR or firewall catch. They catch most of it. Great. And if they don't catch something, I'll write a detection from our SIM or EDR. So we'll catch it next time. So a quick example is, you know, most, ha most hackers, when they get in, they'll run something like, who am I to figure out yep. exactly where they are, what account they have. And we, you know, we saw that our EDR tool didn't detect on it. So we wrote a quick detection anytime we see that. And we, we've caught pen testers like that, you know, with something so simple and so early. So yeah, I just think, you know, using stuff like adversary emulation or even running stuff in command prompts, like who am I or sysinfo yeah. or, you know, net group admin um, is really impactful and, and free. So I, I want to, I kind of want to ask that and absolutely. And I think that that really is the, the evolution of, of security testing where now I, I think I believe we're at a stage where, where it's far more, we're far more realistic in, in testing our, our security defenses. And of course, right, purple team exercises allow a very sort of a quick feedback loop to, to improve that. Um. But when, like, let's say you, you're there, you're shopping for the next security capability that, that you want to bring on board to, to protect, um, sort of in, in this case, Brooks, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you validate that whatever the, the, that vendor is, is, is trying to sell you is actually going to provide you with the security uplift that you're expecting? Like, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, I think it's really important to define, um, really prescriptive success criteria, so like what use case you're trying to find, because you're not going to have a good time if you just go in to look for a vendor and say, you know, I want the capability to do that. Well, why, what are you trying to defend against? And can you emulate that? So, it, you know, if you're looking for uh, a cloud security posture management solution, you know, maybe you do a quick POC and then you make an S3 bucket open to the world, you know, with no data in it and see how quickly it catches it. Um, or for like micro segmentation, maybe you, you know, you have a laptop and you do a vulnerable, um, an Nmap scan to the whole environment and see what can communicate back. Um, and then, you know, you, you put the tool in enforcer mode and see what you can still reach. So I think it just under, you need to understand the use case and the problem you're trying to solve before you even think about looking at vendors. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree, right? Because it's the, and I think both from, from the customer side is having a clear idea of, of the use case that you're trying to solve versus a general, hey, I need this capability, right? It, it's got to be tied to sort of a benefit. And then I think from a vendor perspective is being able to clearly connect with that use case as opposed to saying, again, hey, we're selling you this capability and it just works like this and being able to tie that. I think that's so important. Um, and I, I kind of want to go to the, to the, to the next thing, because like, this is, this is a zero trust leadership podcast. So we could talk a bit about zero trust. Right. And I know that you are a, you're very much a, you, you're a zero trust practitioner. You, you've built like at least two zero trust programs at different 
um, at, uh, at different employers, right? Like, firstly, like, how do you think about zero trust? Like, and why is it, why does it resonate with you? Yeah. So I always think about you know, the target breach from about a decade ago when an HVAC contractor had access into the network um, and then was able to access cardholder data. You know, that, that's one of the reasons we're trying to do it. You know, we're, I basically think about if and when a user is infected, how do we minimize that blast radius, giving them weak privilege access um, so they can't do much damage. Um, and then when you, so when you apply that, right, and, and of course, right, that, that, that absolutely maps to zero, so, so to, to zero trust, sorry, I'm going to start again because I mumbled. Um, so that absolutely maps to the zero trust approach to security. Then how do you then build a program to go and help your, help your organization kind of adopt that approach? Because like it's, we, we hear consistently that zero trust is a great idea but difficult to achieve in practice and yet you've done it twice successfully so what's the secret source that you've got that others need to know sure i mean zero trust is more of a principle like i've been able to apply it in a couple of different ways but in almost everything we do we think about how how can we go toward zero and off the zero ish trust you know yeah. actual zero trust it's really hard to do. And I think it's really intimidating. You know, when I first thought about zero trust, I thought about being able to allow this server to server communication, which really scares me. And it's, you know, really production impacting. But for instance, you know, what we're talking about is micro segmentation from a zero trust perspective. What is the best bang for our buck that we're going to get with being the least disruptive? Because as you and I'm sure your listeners know, I've lost credibility because of a tool, you know, or a technology, some kind of security tool that blocks something, you know, maybe it was the legitimate block, maybe not, but it's really hard to gain that trust back. Yeah. You know, you know I, I've had tools where any kind of something broke, they're like, is it, is it that tool? I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. yeah. So, so kind of going off of that. Uh, we looked at workstation to workstation um, communication, which should be none. And then user to server interaction, because over 90% of our um, employee base are not in IT. So they really don't access servers unless it's through like HTTPS. You know, they're yeah. not remotely accessing them. And when you think about from a threat perspective, most of the intrusions that start with a phishing email on a workstation, you know, people don't normally access email on a server yeah. or they shouldn't. So how do I, how do I make it? So I hear someone got hit with ransomware that we're not having a bad day. You know, they yeah. can't affect any other workstation and they can't affect most other servers. That for me is the zero ish trust from a micro segmentation perspective. And I, I like the way that. The, the, how you said it's zero ish because I think it goes back to something we were talking about earlier is good enough right and it, it's kind of that drawing that line between this I know that this is where the I, and I think sort of to paraphrase what you just said is I know that these are the biggest risks with overly permissive access within my network right so that's the that's the access that I'm going to focus on reducing that implicit trust Right. So moving towards more sort of zero implicit trust because and but I draw the line here because beyond this, the, the return I get for the effort I'm putting in is negligible or potentially I think going back and that, that was a really important point about about no one wants it's potentially a career defining often. Right. Security controls are career defining because if they go well, right. And you're able to show that you've reduced sort of risk uh, and your exposure, then sort of everyone sings your praises. But there's a far greater chance that some critical application will break, and they'll be like, "Hey, hey, Ryan, hey, Ragu, let's have a chat about this thing that you just uh, that you just yeah. applied." And as you said, you have to sort of spend hours, days explaining why it wasn't your product that caused the issue. Um, so, 
uh, I, again, right. Uh, I think maybe just to reiterate, like, how do you, like, what is that measure that says at this point, the, up till this point, the effort is worthwhile, right? That's the good enough. And then beyond this, the cost is high to get more benefits. Like, how do you draw that line in the sand? Sure. It can definitely be uh, subjective. But for me, I think about the administrative overhead and then the production to impact, uh, the production impact to application. You know, people in their job description, other than us, they're not, they're not, it doesn't say to be secure, right? Like they need their applications to run. But I can give a good example of something we didn't do because I didn't think it was worth the bang for the buck. So another potential risk is let's say a server gets infected and they visit a command and control domain and download malware, um, mm -hmm. and then they're infected straight from the server, didn't require a user to connect to it. Now, one thing we could do is do zero trust where we only allow applications or servers to go to specific uh, domains, right? Certain websites. Realistically, you know, website or servers don't go to a lot of websites. But the, the work behind that is incredible. And I only yep. know that because we tried it, you know, servers, yep. there's so many domains on a website that things reach out to, mm. so it'd be an administrative nightmare and production impacting if let's say they download a new application, it doesn't work. And let's say it's someone in Asia or Europe mm. and I'm the person doing it. So really what I think about is what's the risk? The risk is our DNS not catching that domain, our EDR not catching that domain, our firewall not catching that domain, and it's a C2 server. Can, in, can a state actor do that? Sure. But for me, that's not worth it because yep. of how production impacting it could be. So we've, we've done it other ways. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've kind of had sort of had a, have a similar experience. So I, I absolutely uh sort of understand that so what what is like the future for like your zero trust program and how you think about that continued evolution what does that look like yeah i think for micro segmentation you know making sure it's applied everywhere uh looking at different use cases maybe more from a visibility perspective to figure out what's talking to what you know we look at public cloud and making sure we're using as least privilege as possible when it comes to roles and access and such. Um, and then just lead privilege access in general across our Active Directory account, both in Azure and on-prem. Yeah. And those are some of the big things we're working on. And and you kind of talked about cloud a few times, right? Uh, and, and sort of the, and, and often sort of organizations and, and practitioners sort of differentiate between cloud security and traditional sort of like campus and data center security right and, and actually i was at a i was at a um a, i was at a sort of an event uh earlier this week and on stage was uh essentially the person who ran devops um or devsecops at a, at a large um financial organization and what he said was that that's the 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 problem we've created is by saying okay i do separate security differently or how I think about security differently for cloud versus legacy, traditional, whatever you want to call it, right? What, what are your thoughts? Because his perspective was you need to think about those in the same way so that you have consistent security. Like, how do you yeah, think? I, I absolutely agree. You know, the thing I always go by is the cloud is just an extension of your data center. You know, whether it's a VM, a Windows VM in the cloud or in your data center or under your deck. Like it still needs to get patched. It still needs a certain agent. And that's a really dangerous view to view them separately. And I think it is taking some time to get used to, you know, both from a security and infrastructure perspective. But like you said, I mean, the controls need to be similar. Now, when you get to certain things like services, like Lambda services and, you know, storage containers, those can be different, but you know, a VM is a VM is a VM, whether it's ephemeral yeah. or not. So you still do need that visibility and patching and such, just like you would in your data center. 
So what sort of now, when you look at what you're looking at sort of into the, into the future, right? What are the, what are the trends, technologies that are really sort of excite you? I, I know you've spoken a bit about your passion project, um, but sort of what are you really looking forward to happening in the cybersecurity world? Yeah, I think just improvement in asset management, like we talked about more of that API based approach to figure out, you know, what's your total asset count. That's a hard thing to find out. But I also think, you know, in the coming years, we'll see some more, uh, some more technology around API security. I think that's something that companies probably have more exposure than they realize, you know, especially if they have application calling application in your network or more likely in other SaaS based applications or network. And you, you might have no idea like what kind of security you have for that. So I'm really excited to see that technology to find out where are your APIs and what kind of security do you have around them? And then having that developer based approach where that's not my expertise, but I would love a tool that'll put it in the developer language and with the proper criticality so they can fix it. And actually, you kind of hinted on sort of developer, right? And we hear a lot of sort of terms like DevSecOps and a shift left and secure by design or secure by default, right? I'm by no means an expert in any of these terms, but I just, I, I, I'm a sort of, what is it? I'm dangerous enough that I've, uh, that I've sort of read them and I kind of, kind of I can blurt them out. What are these, what do these mean to you? And what do they mean to sort of what you do as a practitioner? Yeah, I think shift left is really important. I've been on both sides where, you know, developers will say, hey, we have this application that's going to be going in production for two, in two weeks. Like, can you just give a sign on? And I'm like, what? And, you know, <laughs> and then we use different tools to be able to try to look at application vulnerabilities and such. And we figure it out, but, you know, most likely it's going to go live anyway. Yeah, so ideally yeah. we get involved with the be from the beginning. And I don't have a huge application development background, but sometimes I find just having security in the room makes them talk or behave differently. So getting in in that initial discussion, but then I, I also think it's really important because there are, you know, data code analysis tools, dynamic code analysis tools, let the developer pick what they like, because most likely I'm not going to be, be in it day to day. I want something that's developer friendly. Um, and so we've had good success with that. Well, obviously we want to look at it to see if it has the baseline minimum of, you know, security type checks, but we want it to be in a language where they understand and we're more of like in a consultative mm -hmm. role. So I want to ask about that, right? Cause I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of been playing with the idea that zero, like adopting zero trust, a zero trust approach to security really aligns with a a shift left right sort of and taking that rather than a trying to block back things being sort of explicit about saying these are the good things i want to allow very much aligns with let's say the development of an application where it's almost you're saying okay i know these are the things i need the application to do and i want to write the security rules that allow me to do that so do you think it, it, it is the case that um as sort of we see security shift left, that will, in order to make that practical, it'll be an increased adoption of zero trust or put it a different way, um, essentially more focus on de defining uh, like an allow list based security. Yeah, I think this shift left definitely plays along with it. You know, I think about now as we onboard new servers or applications, we're involved earlier because it's going to be put into our micro segmentation environment and we want to understand what communication that tool actually needs. I can give a quick example. You know, we've had an application where the vendor said we need ports one through 65,000 open, which is what? wild and extremely lazy of that vendor. What, what so about the other it, sort of, of other few hundred at the end? They didn't want those. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're trying to, the we, you know, we've privilege or zero edge trap. Uh, so, you know, if we're involved early, we can let it run for a month and see that maybe it's a range of only a hundred or, mm. you know, a thousand ports. 
Uh, but if we're not involved early and they install the application without us knowing, and it's already in production, we're probably going to have to keep the one to 65,000 unless we have extensive work and, you know, a quick feedback loop. So being involved early in that requirement phase and looking at the data, uh, that helps you be successful in a zero-ish trust strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's, that, that I think then comes back to sort of the, uh, the maturity, um, you were talking about, right? That as that program matures, it's kind of naturally, um, the engagement of security shifts further and further to the left, right? And, and again, how far left really depends on sort of how far you want to take, um, take that program. Um, I, I mean, like we, we've, we've said this, there's so much more that, that we can, that we can discuss, um, but I'm conscious of your sort of, of, of your time. I mean, like sort of what, what are you excited about in, in terms of the future, right? What are the things that you'd want listeners to hear and sort of go, sort of take away and maybe put it to practice? Yeah. I've been, I mean, talking about like the control validation, I've been really excited to see the shift in security of really the collaboration and the actionable threat intelligence. I think MITRE ATT&CK has been a really, really positive thing for the industry to basically codify what attackers are doing from a high level. So to be able to be part of an information sharing group or go to a conference or just read articles and see what are hackers using and then giving you the value or the command to run, um, that way you can run it in your environment to see if you are affected. Because previously you'd have a pen test once a year. And then after that, you have to wait until next year. And it, yeah. it comes, becomes stale very quickly because of the adapting environment. Yeah. So I'm really excited to continue to see that happen and maybe even ship to the cloud to see, you know, what are logs that I should be looking at? Where, what are attackers doing? How can I emulate it? How can I see um, if it would work? Or... Awesome. Well. The other thing, right, is it, is it true, Brooks running, you do all of your important security meetings while out for a run in Brooks, Brooks trainers? Is that, is that true? Just let yeah, us know. Yeah, I think, I was, I, think <laughs> I was telling you prior, you know, as I interviewed, you have to send in your 5K time and, and be <laughs> under 20 minutes, so. <laughs> well, ha having run with you, um, I'm pretty confident that you could do a sub-20 uh, sub uh, if, you, <laughs> if you tried. I know you're going easy on me that day. Um, Ryan, I mean, it's been such a pleasure to have you. It's always a pleasure to converse with such a, a wonderful sort of security professional like yourself. Um, so thank you so much time. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It's been great.